Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the LDL receptor. Okay, so we're just currently in the process of discussing the different types of lipid molecules. Okay, so we've discussed the triacylglycerols and the phospholipids, which are all based on the structure of phosphatidic acid. Now what we want to discuss is the structure of the sphingolipids and also the structure of cholesterol. Okay, so let's start off with the sphingolipids. And basically, we're discussing the sphingolipids to see other examples of uh, phospholipids. Okay, so sphingolipids is another more niche area of lipids than are the phosphoglycerolipids and the triacylglycerols, but they are still common within the body. Okay, so sphingolipids are all based on a new molecule that I'm just going to have to introduce you to. Okay, and this molecule is called sphingosine. Now, sphingosine is an 18-carbon molecule, okay, and most of its structure is extremely hydrophobic. Okay, so it has a great long tail, which is completely saturated and is therefore extremely hydrophobic. However, at its head, it has some more interesting groups. So, for instance, it has two alcohol groups at its head. It also has an amino group, okay? And basically, what's going to happen is to create a sphingolipid, you're going to start with a sphingosine molecule. And you're firstly going to go from a sphingosine molecule to something called a ceramide molecule. Okay, so to go from a sphingosine to a ceramide, what you have to do is you have to add in a long chain carboxylic acid onto the sphingosine molecule. Okay, so let me add some colour onto this. So here's the sphingosine molecule in red. And basically, you are going to attach a long chain carboxylic acid onto the amino group of the ceramide, uh, sorry, of the sphingosine molecule. So remember, I told you that one of the important groups the sphingosine has at its head is an amino group. You are going to attach a carbo long chain carboxylic acid onto that amino group via an amide link. Okay, so let me just remind you of what an amide link is, just in case you've forgotten. So, let's say this is the amino group of the sera oh, sorry, of the sphingosine molecule, okay? And here is the long chain carboxylic acid here. So here's its carboxylic acid group, and here is its long tail. And basically what you're going to do is you're going to remove the alcohol group of the carboxylic acid group, you're going to remove the hydrogen of the amino group, and you're then going to bind this nitrogen atom to the carbon atom of that long chain carboxylic acid. And that link there is called an amide link. Okay, so this is an amide link. Right, so that's what we're going to do firstly. To create a ceramide, you add on a long chain carboxylic acid onto your sphingosine molecule via an amide link. Okay, now, clearly there is not just one ceramide molecule, because there is not just one long chain carboxylic acid. There are many different ceramide molecules that you can create by adding different long chain carboxylic acids on. Okay, now, we're not yet at a sphingolipid. So basically, to get a sphingolipid, what you then have to do is modify this further. So, you take a ceramide, which is a sphingosine molecule with a long chain carboxylic acid bound to it, and then you're going to add onto this ceramide structure a group onto the first carbon of uh, the uh, sphingosine molecule. So basically, you remember I told you that uh, the head of the sphingosine molecule has these three important groups. One of them is an amino group, which comes off the second carbon of the sphingosine molecule. Uh, the uh, other two are alcohol groups, which come off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule and the third carbon of the sphingosine molecule. Okay, uh, so basically, we are going to attach a group onto the alcohol group that comes off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule, and this is now going to create us a sphingolipid. So this structure here is called a sphingolipid. And basically, there are many different groups that you can add on to that alcohol group of um, the um, 
first carbon of the sphingosine molecule, okay? But basically, if you add a group that has a phosphate group on it, onto that uh, first carbon's alcohol group, then you end up with a type of sphingolipid known as a sphingomyelin. Okay, so we're going to be specifically interested in a subset of the sphingolipids, which are the sphingomyelins. And basically, what the sphingomyelins all have in common is that this group that you add on to the alcohol group of the first carbon of the uh, sphingosine molecule will have a phosphate group initially. So you attach a phosphate group onto the alcohol group of the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule via a phosphoester link. And then you might have another extra bit added on to the other side of that phosphate group via a phosphoester link. For instance, what you could have is a choline molecule here. That would be a good example of a sphingomyelin. Okay, so you'd have a sphingosine molecule here in red. Okay, you'd have some long chain carboxylic acid off the amino group of the second carbon of the sphingosine molecule. Then off the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule, you'd have a phosphate group, and then potentially another group here, such as choline, would be an example. Okay, and uh, when you've got that structure, you're called a sphingomyelin, and you're therefore an example of a sphingolipid. Sphingolipids don't all have to have a phosphate group coming off the alcohol group of the first sphingosine molecule. Oh no, there's a huge repertoire of sphingolipids that don't have that. But we're specifically in interested in these because these are also phospholipids. They are phospholipids that are not phosphoglycerolipids. Okay, because they satisfy the definition. They have a long chain carboxylic acid here in orange within their structure, and they also have a phosphate group here in purple. Okay, and for this reason, people will often denote phospholipids like so. Okay, so they will denote phospholipids just like so because basically this covers. Um, both the phosphoglycerolipids and also the sphingomyelins, which are the main two examples of phospholipids. Because basically, what do the two structures have in common? If I just get you the structure of a phosphoglycerolipid back again, okay, so here are the two long chain carboxylic acids. Here's the glycerol molecule, here's the phosphate group, and here is that additional group here. Basically, you can hopefully see that they've got a very similar structure, actually. They've got these two long chain carboxylic acids, okay, on the phosphoglycerolipid, and on the sphingomyelin, what you've got is a long chain carboxylic acid, and then a really hydrophobic tail that is like a long chain carboxylic acid from the sphingosine molecule. So effectively, you've got these two hydrophobic tails, okay, and that's what's denoted by these two lines here in the uh, cartoon of a phospholipid. So these are two hydrophobic tails, okay? And then by the ball, what we denote is the polar head of the phosphate group, uh, sorry, the polar head of the phospholipid, okay? And both structures, again, have one of these polar heads. So for instance, if we look at the structure of sphingomyelin, we've got a phosphate group and then some other group, such as choline added on there. And if we look at the uh, phosphoglycerolipid, we've got a phosphate group and then some additional groups such as choline there. And these portions are polar and interact well with water. So that's the logic in this picture. And we will use this picture later on when we refer to phospholipids. And you should remember that that could either mean a phosphoglycerolipid or one of these sphingomyelins. Okay, right. So, on to the final uh, form of lipid molecules then cholesterol, and we also want to discuss uh, cholesterol esters. Okay, so basically, cholesterol is a sterol, and to discuss what a sterol is, we need to start with what a steroid is. So this comes as a shock to most people when they find this out for the first time, uh, that steroid molecules are actually defined chemically. They're defined on the uh, basis of their chemical structure. It's a chemical criterion, not a biological criterion. 
most people think of steroids as molecules that have some uh, biological activity. So they think it's a biological definition on the basis of the function of the molecule, when in fact it's actually a chemical definition. So steroid molecules have to have this structure within them. Okay, so basically the pure steroid structure is four uh, carbon rings linked together. Okay, so you've got three six-membered carbon rings and then a five-membered carbon ring right on the end, like so. Okay, right. So that's the basic structure of a steroid molecule. Now, whenever anyone draws steroids, they always draw them in skeletal uh, formulae because if you draw them in skeletal formulae, you get something beautifully uh, simple that looks ridiculously simple, almost. Okay, uh, because in skeletal formulae, you don't show carbon atoms. They're implicitly shown by corners and by meeting points of bonds, okay? And you also don't show hydrogen atoms coming off carbon atoms, okay? Uh, and all the basic steroid structure has is carbon atoms and then hydrogen atoms coming off those carbon atoms. So it means that the steroid structure is beautifully simple when we draw its skeletal formula. Okay, so to now turn a steroid molecule into a sterol molecule, what you do is you add an alcohol group onto this carbon down here of the steroid structure. Okay, so that's a sterol structure. And now we want to turn this sterol into cholesterol specifically. So firstly, we turn this bond here into a double bond. Then we take hydrogens off this carbon and this carbon and replace them by methyl groups like so, and then off this carbon up here we put a rather fancy side chain consisting of a seven carbon main structure, then with a methyl group coming off the sixth carbon here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's our main structure, and we're joined onto the second carbon here, and then off the sixth carbon over here you also have a methyl group. So it's kind of beautiful the way it's symmetric in that way. Okay, right. So, this is the structure of a cholesterol molecule. Now, most of this structure is extremely hydrophobic because we've got bonds between carbon atoms and then we've got bonds between carbon atoms and hydrogen atoms. And carbon has the same electronegativity as carbon and carbon has roughly the same electronegativity as hydrogen. So, you don't have much polarity there, and this is an extremely hydrophobic structure. However, down here, we have an alcohol group. Now, alcohol groups are very polar, okay? Uh, oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen, okay? So, we do have one little uh, glimpse of a polar structure down here. So, cholesterol does have a little polar head here, and that will become important uh, later. Now, you can destroy that polar head of the cholesterol molecule if you are so inclined, and you can create a structure which is truly uh, neutral uh, and has, uh, you know, the same, um, the same sort of claim to the title of a neutral fat molecule as the triacylglycerols. So they are as neutral as the triacylglycerols. And basically, these molecules are going to be cholesterol esters. Okay, right. So, how do you create a cholesterol ester? Well, basically, what you do is you find yourself a long chain carboxylic acid. Okay, so let's show some long chain carboxylic acid coming in over here. So, here comes some long chain carboxylic acid. And basically, what you're going to do is you're going to bind this long chain carboxylic acid to uh, the alcohol group of the cholesterol molecule via an ester link. So you're going to take off the alcohol group of the long chain carboxylic acid, you're going to take off the hydrogen of the alcohol group, bind those two together to make water, and then bind this carbon atom to the oxygen atom to create an ester link there. And the overall molecule you then get, which is a cholesterol molecule with a long chain carboxylic acid dangling off its alcohol group down here via an ester link, that's called a cholesterol ester. And those are extremely hydrophobic. Okay, right. 
So that's our discussion of the uh, fatty molecules complete now. In the next video, what we'll move on to is a discussion of the endogenous pathway, which is basically a way of delivering fat molecules to skeletal and cardiac muscle tissues when you are in the fasted state. Because basically, uh, skeletal and cardiac muscle tissues are unusual. They prefer to use uh, fatty acid molecules, long-chain carboxylic acids, as their energy source rather than carbohydrates. So, for instance, other tissues, such as the brain, notably, refuse to use uh, fat molecules as their energy source, okay? They will only use carbohydrates, or they make the exception for ketone bodies. Whereas skeletal muscle, and notably the heart muscle, absolutely love to use long-chain carboxylic acids as their energy source. They love to use beta-oxidation. So basically, we want to be continuously feeding the heart and the skeletal muscle, if obviously it's active, uh, with these lipid molecules uh, to keep them going, basically. And we need to be able to do this in the fasted state. So we can do it using another pathway called the exogenous pathway if you've just consumed uh, a fatty meal. So if you just consumed a fatty meal, you'll have lots of fats in your intestine, and basically uh, these fats will be digested and absorbed, and then they'll go into chylomicrons, and the chylomicrons will deliver them to the skeletal and cardiac muscle, and that's called the exogenous pathway, because the source of the lipid is exogenous, okay? We're not going to be interested in that in this video. We're going to be interested in the endogenous pathway, which is when that isn't happening, when the exogenous pathway isn't happening because you're in the fasted state, okay? We want to basically get a source of lipids to the uh, long, well, to the uh, skeletal and cardiac muscle cells uh, from an endogenous source. Okay, so we'll turn our attention to that pathway in the next video.